turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter number one. Ephesians is the first book of the Bible over 10 years ago that I ever preached through as a pastor. It has a special place in my heart. Um, uh, Ephesians is one of my favorite books, actually. And after going through Ecclesiastes for months and months, it was like a cool, fresh spring of, of gladness to go through it. But first, Ephesus. So you see on the map there, big old thing that says Ephesus. That's the Ephesians or citizens, Christian citizens of Ephesus. Ephesus is in Asia Minor, what is now known as Turkey, and how is the temple of Artemis, the goddess of the hunt, which was one of the seven wonders of the world. Artemis was also known as Diana to the Romans, and she was also the goddess of the wilderness, and more importantly to the Ephesians, of seductive fertility practices, of which they made a whole lot of money. Ephesus also housed the library of Celsus, which contained over 12,000 scrolls, and a theater capable of holding an audience of 24,000 people. This is a big metropolitan center. This is the largest in the ancient world. Historic poets, authors, and philosophers called Ephesus home, a list that we don't have time to go into this morning. We know that the culture of Ephesus cared a whole lot about their sexual immorality, elevating it to something to be worshipped, and selling little pagan trinkets and baubles of Artemis in order to pay for it. They also cared about philosophy and education. They cared a whole, whole lot about entertainment, sort of similar to how we live today. The reason I like Ephesians is Ephesians is a handbook for the Christian life. It has everything that you need to know how you ought to function. And the thing about Ephesians is, yes, it has theology, but also it has practical application. But before we get into practical application of husbands and wives and employers and employees and how you deal with things in church in the second half of the book, the entire first half of the book is theological. The entire first half of the book actually isn't what you should do. It's what God has already done. It is what's called indicative. It indicates what you are rather than um, uh, imperative, which is what you must do. Now, one of the problems, one of the big errors that people make is they jump to the second half of the book first without looking at the first half of the book of what God has done. And all throughout the Bible, this is the pattern that always must take place. God acts first, and then we act. God does his works, and then we do good works. If you reverse the order, it is a dire consequences to say that, well, we work, therefore God will do his blessing. No, no. God blesses first. And that, out of that blessing, out of what he's given us, that is why we then follow him. Let's read our text this morning. Go to that second slide. Ephesians chapter number one, starting in verse one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we have an inheritance. Uh, I have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit 
who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Paul is writing to this church in Ephesus, the saints there who are the Christians, those who put their faith and trust in Jesus. And he says he's an apostle by the will of God. He's writing to those who are faithful in Jesus Christ. If you are faithful in Jesus Christ, you put your faith and trust in him as your Lord and Savior, this book eminently applies to you. So he says in verse number three, blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Pop quiz time, somebody. How many spiritual blessings? Every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing that there is to possess belongs to Christians. Every single one that would ever be in existence is ours to claim. Not because of what we've done all throughout this. This isn't what we do. It's according to his purpose. It's according to his will. It's according to his plan. And it's all to his glory that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing that there is to have. So what he does then is he lists 20 spiritual blessings. You say, well, what spiritual blessings? Well, here is 20. Now, you can go throughout the Bible. And the fact is there's many more than just 20. But he gives what is grammatically incorrect because from verses 3 to verse 14, he has one big run-on sentence. In your translation, there may be periods and commas. There's none in the original. It's just one big thing from one thought to the next to the next to the next. So any of you students that get bad marks in English, you can say, well, the Apostle Paul did. <laughs> So, what are these 20 blessings that are ours? Go ahead and go to that next slide. Now, we won't be able to cover a 20-point sermon, but we will get through them. There you go. Verse 4. Blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Christian, believer, has put your faith and trust in Jesus. You are chosen by him. It wasn't an accident that you were a Christian. It wasn't a begrudging aspect of God. Well, I guess I'll choose this person. You are wanted by God. You are chosen by God. He specifically, in eternity past, before anything ever was, knew this is the people that I want for my name. This is the people that I will save. There was no realm of no multiverse or no possibility that you would not come to faith in Jesus Christ because he chose you before the foundation of the world even was. Before there was an Ephesus, before there was a Roman Empire, before there was an Egyptian Empire, before the creation of the stars and the galaxies and the universe itself, before anything ever existed, he chose you to be his. Sometimes you wonder, well, does God love me? He always has loved you. He has never stopped loving you. And why has he chosen you? Chosen you that you should be holy, set apart. You're not the same as everybody else. Jesus, God, when he chose you, says, that's my boy. That's my girl. You are different than all the others. Not because of what you have done, not because of an innate difference for you, but he has made you different. He has made you holy. He has made you set apart. Not only that, next blessing is blameless. How much blame does a Christian have? Paul's very clear. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no sin that can be marked on your account. There is no thing that can be held over your head that you have repented of. There is no thing that in that final day, Jesus is going to turn you away. And then in verse number five, it says, in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. The next blessing is he's predestined us in love. Now, what's interesting to me is people get all 
bent out of shape about predestination and what it means and what it doesn't mean and, and all these things, if it's some kind of an intellectual puzzle. Paul here presents predestination as a basic Christian doctrine. He's not giving them high theology. In fact, he doesn't even explain it to them because he assumes they already know it. This isn't a new word that they've only heard for the first time. And this predestination, what is it marked by? It's marked by love. In love, he predestined you. What is the impetus? What is the force for who he predestined to be chosen and adopted as sons? His love is. If you have any other cause, any other source of predestination besides love, you have gotten it very wrong. And on the flip side, to deny predestination is to deny an aspect of God's love for his people. Predestination means that the beginning of your identity, of who you are, the first thing that you could say of you is that you were blessed. You had a spiritual blessing before you were even you. Before you even existed, you were already blessed by God. This is a basic doctrine that once again he assumes this doctrine is connected to his omnipotence, that he is all-powerful, can and does do whatever he pleases. From the early Baptists, to Anglicans, to the Continental Reform, to Lutherans, to even early medieval Catholicism, to the early church before Roman Catholicism, they were all what is called monergistic, which means God does the work of salvation. It is almost as basic and universal a doctrine as the Apostles' Creed is. God is the one that does it. Me just saying, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I claim. I have nothing to offer. God did it all. He has blessed us in predestination, but in predestination, in love, he adopted us. Because we weren't previously of the people of God. We were from every other tribe, tongue, and language, hostile to God, separated from God, bitter from God. And Paul's going to talk about that in a few chapters where he talks about the reunification of God's people, but he has adopted us as his people. You know, it's interesting in the Roman legal system, a legal son, if you were born uh, of natural birth, could be disinherited in the Roman system. An adopted son, by law, could never be disinherited. If you chose them to be part of your family, you could never cut them off. And he says that we when were predestined before we ever were to be adopted as his children. Verse 6. He predestined us to the adoption of his sons according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace. The reason he did this, the reason he chose you in love to be adopted into his family is because you will be the object of of praise to his glorious grace. On that final day when we all gather around the throne of God and we get all the praise and honor and glory lifted up to him, the prizes that he is going to show to show the attributes of his grace and how glorious and magnificent his grace is, is you, Reformation Church. His people. Look at these lost sinners. I didn't destroy them. I didn't obliterate them. I didn't forever condemn them. Instead, I saved them with grace that they did not deserve. Something that angels themselves long to look into, meaning they don't understand this kind of salvation. Fallen angels, once they sin, they're done. They're condemned forever. Human beings, we sin, and he sends his only begotten son to live and suffer and die and rise again so he could adopt us and forgive us to be objects of his praise for all eternity. For angels, that doesn't make sense. For us, it's a normal, ordinary reality of life. We don't realize how blessed we really are. Believer, not only are you the praise of his glorious grace for the time to come in the future, you are the praise of his glorious grace today. 
right now. What he has done and what he is doing in your life to show his grace to the world. It says, it continues, in which he has blessed us in the beloved. His, another translation of blessed us here is he favored us in the beloved. God's favor is upon his people. God isn't against you. God isn't trying to destroy you. And sometimes this world beats and batters you raw. And you think, is God trying to destroy me? But in, for, in Christ, in God, you are favored. He is on your side. He's always been on your side. And no matter what happens, all things must work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. No matter how bad it may seem, never doubt God's favor upon you as a believer in Jesus Christ. Verse 8, riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us and all wisdom and insight. You see, beloved, he didn't just give us grace meaning giving us something we didn't deserve. He gave us lavish grace. He lavished it upon us. It is to be in excess, this word, to overflow. You know, like those, those nasty commercials in the, the, the theater where they have the, the uh, cup of Coke and it overflows anywhere, everywhere, and I think that's how sticky that is, but for some reason it's supposed to be refreshing. Well, what, he, what this is is, God's grace for you overflows lavishly more than you could possibly ever need or have, more than you could ever run out of. It is a ridiculous amount of more quantity than is needed is the grace that God gives you. To use an incorrect term, when it comes to God's grace, he spoils you rotten. It gives you more than you could ever ask for or think. Verse 9, not only that, he's made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Just this morning, we were reading about Moses, we're going over the in, in Sunday school, and the, the patriarchs, and Joseph, and all the, the characters in the Old Testament, did you know that we know more than they do? Even Moses, who spoke to God face to face, we have more theology, more of God's revelation than even Moses had. We have this blessing of his word. We have the blessing of the mystery of his will revealed to us. Because on this side of the cross, we know what the, all the pinnacle of all of human history was in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything was leading up to that, and everything after that points back to it. For all eternity, we will be praising about it. We know this. It's been revealed to us. Verse 10. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things in earth. We have one of the most sweetest doctrines ever, that of the unity of with Christ, that not only are we walking beside Christ, or not only is Christ around in our life, the Bible says we are united with him. We are, it uses the language, we are in him, as if Christ could be a flowing wave of water that surrounds us. We are in Christ Jesus. Like those warm blankets that you make a fort out of when you're a kid. We are in Christ Jesus. We are united in him and he will unite in him all things in heaven and on earth. So because of that, the next blessing, we have obtained an inheritance. We've been given the promises of all things. You know that our final destination is not heaven. It's not like the Looney Tunes where we strung on harps in the clouds. That's a boring looking heaven. I don't really want to go there. Instead, what he promises is a new heaven and a new earth where all things will be recreated, where we will actually have bodies and we will have jobs 
and we will have things to do and we will expand and grow and live and thrive in his kingdom to his praise and glorious grace for all eternity. I don't know exactly what we're going to do, but it's going to be exciting. It's not going to be strumming on harps and clouds. So what has God's people inherited? Everything. In, in one sense, it's true. This world, this current age is not my home. But in another sense, all of this is mine. All of this is ours. All of this is yours. Jesus Christ, when he returns again, will recreate it all to be with him. We have this inheritance. Verse 12, he continues on. So that we who are first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. We have hope. Hope that gets us through. That even though this world may batter and bruise you, our hope is in Jesus Christ, who will always lead us through. Hope gives us the strength that we could not stand on our own. He gives it to us. And he gives us this hope to be the objects of the praise of his glory. Now, this is the second time we were objects of something related to God. The first time, objects of praise to his glorious grace. Now, it's objects of praise to his glory. What this means is his magnificence, his wowness, his awesomeness, that all of creation, angels included, when the saints of God who were redeemed, when we, the believers in Jesus Christ, stand before the throne of God, what they are going to say when they see us is, wow, God, what did you do? That's amazing. What am I? A worm made of dust. That in all of eternity, I'll be an object of the praise of God's glory. Something to be looked at with amazement because of what God has done. Verse 13. In him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were given the word of truth. This world is a world of darkness. This world is a world of misdirection and lying, where we don't even know what to believe and what not to believe. He has given us and revealed to us his holy word that we never have to wonder what true truth really is, what real truth really is. The truth that matters really is. Not only that, he has given us not just truth in general, but the gospel of our salvation. The gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that all who put their faith and trust in him will have, be recipients of every single one of these spiritual blessings. Not only that, another blessing that he gave you that you may not realize he even gave is the blessing of belief. Your faith that you have, it's not your own either. It's something that he gave you, that he enabled you, that he awaked within you to call upon him. You say, well, I called on God to save me. Yes, you did. And he's the one that caused you to do it. He's the one that allowed you to. Just as the first act of a newborn babe is to cry out to their mother, so too the first act of a regenerate soul is to cry out to God, save me. He gave you the very belief that you have. And because of that, it says, the next blessing, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Kings of old would have their signet rings that would seal the marks of their decrees, knowing that this was valid and none oppose it. God has put his mark, his seal upon you. So no others may have you. No other rightful claimants can come against you. None can defy the word of God that he has proclaimed upon you. This seal is marked upon you, which can never be taken away. And this seal is the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. You are never truly alone. The Holy Spirit is always there. Moving, guiding, teaching, convicting, comforting. This Holy Spirit that it says was promised. 
an aspect of communion with the Holy Spirit that saints of old did not quite understand, even though there was the Holy Spirit working in the Old Testament in a much more consistent way. We have this spiritual blessing now being sealed, having God's mark upon us. And this seal, is verse 14, is a guarantee of our inheritance. This guarantee isn't just a sure thing that we have. That's an aspect of guarantee, but the language here is actually much stronger. This word here for guarantee is, it's the first installment. It's the down payment. Where I'm going to go and I'm going to put forth a guarantee of money and then later on I'm going to come and give you the rest of the money. The aspect of having the Holy Spirit inside of us means that right now in this present age we get to live as if we're living in the new heaven and the new earth. He has given you a foretaste. He's given you an aspect. He's given you a down payment, a first installment of heavenly life in this age right now. Now, one day, it will be the full thing. Right now isn't the full thing. Right now, there's still stress, and there's still worry and anxiety, and there's all, all the tribulations and trials. But even through all of those, we have the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. We have an aspect that we can live out a pure, holy, glorified life right now in this age. Now, of all these blessings that we've been given. Where is the source of these things? If you were keen on reading through this or noticing it, notice how many times it says in him or in Christ. The source of these blessings are all his. In fact, 23 times it uses either in him, in Christ, or God as the subject of what Paul is talking about. So that means per each verse, God is the subject an average of 1.7 times in every single verse, every line. God is practically the beginning and ending of every statement here in this passage. God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. In fact, if we counted it up, there's 1.4 blessings listed per verse on average. Paul can't stop listing the various ways that we are blessed. This week when I was studying this, I was surprised. Because these are all things we know. It's so easy to go through this life thinking we aren't blessed. Because we are so used to God's blessing. He abundantly blesses us every single day of our lives that as soon as there's some little thing that we don't like or even some big thing that we don't like, it somehow in our brain negates every other blessing that he lavishes upon us every single day. This, beloved, these blessings, these promises, this is how you then apply everything else in this book. But if these blessings and promises are not yours because you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord, don't even worry about trying to fulfill all the other things in this book because you can't. But if these are yours, then you've been given the power. You've been given the ability through the leaning of the Holy Spirit to follow through with applying unto good works what God has said. Just as in this short passage, there are so many blessings if you look through the Bible, there's even more spiritual promises that are yours. Every single time you see one in the Bible. This is why what it means in 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. Every single promise of God you ask, is this apply to me? Yes, in Christ, it does. You see, if, every, if you see any spiritual blessing, it is yours. None is left out. Now make no mistake. It is out of and from all these promises that we live, apply, and do the rest of the book of Ephesians. Trying to live out the application parts of Ephesians without grasping on and holding dearly to these promises is like trying to use a microwave with no electricity. 
is just not going to work. Before we get to what you should do and how you should live in this book, first, beloved, first Reformation Church, sit back, rest, and hear what God has done for you. What God says is the very thing I have made you to accomplish, I have already accomplished within you. You have all the resources of heaven itself to do exactly what you need to do. In order to illustrate something, I'm going to do an interpretive error. I'll correct it afterward. I'm going to read this passage again. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to Mike and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed Kendall in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as he chose Ron in him before the foundation of the world that Joe should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined Deanna for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed Skip in the beloved. In him, Kristen has redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of Cameron's trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon Rob in all wisdom and insight making known to Brad the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, Lisa has obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that as Emily has hoped in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, Brandon also, when he heard the word of truth, the gospel of Courtney's salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of Cece's inheritance until we all acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Now, these promises aren't meant individualistically. It's a plural you, a y'all. The point is, these promises are for us. These promises are for Reformation Church. These promises are for every Christian who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord. Church, you are blessed. Every spiritual blessing that there is to be blessed with. We remember that in the Lord's Supper. This is the source that we get all those blessings from, what it represents the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. All those in hymns is because he died and rose again. And from that death and resurrection, we have every spiritual blessing there is to have. At this time, Pastor Skip is going to come and lead us in a time of reflection and invitation based on what you've heard.